You're a researcher working at Site-19 for the SCP Foundation just going about your day, minding your own business. You've spent your morning keeping an eye on the D-Classes who are keeping their eyes on SCP-173. The clock strikes noon, and you decide to break for lunch, where you'll enjoy the delicious tuna sandwich you made for yourself this morning. You're sitting alone in one of Site-19's numerous employee break rooms, chewing the first bite of your sandwich as you try in vain to wrap your head around SCP-055. The unknowable anti-meme, when a scent wafts past your nose, it's the worst thing you've ever smelled. Like a mix of body odor, dirt, and musty old clothes. You turn to look for the source of the smell, and suddenly realize that you're not alone in the room. There's a man standing next to you. He's tall, with a scruffy face lined by age. He's wearing a long woolen coat that dangles past his knees. He doesn't say a word though. He's just staring, but not at you. At your sandwich. Before you can open your tuna-filled mouth to say something, his greatcoat opens, and a long green tentacle slithers out grabbing your sandwich and pulling it out of your hands. You start to protest, and then another limb emerges from the coat, long and reptilian. It places a single finger upon your lips and shushes you. The tentacle lifts your delicious tuna sandwich up to the strange man's face and he starts to eat it in front of you, maintaining eye contact the entire time. Then after he finishes your lunch, he just turns and makes his exit, leaving you alone in the break room and hungry. Later that day, you request a meeting with your supervisor, hoping to get some answers about what you saw in the break room. Maybe some compensation for the stolen sandwich. Or at the very least, a little sympathy for how hungry you've been all afternoon. But your supervisor does none of that. Instead, the color drains from their cheeks and they begin to sweat. You ask what's wrong, and your supervisor murmurs one brief sentence. You just met the most powerful person in the world. Of course you've heard of the O5 Council. They're the most powerful people in the entire SCP Foundation, both in terms of institutional control and perhaps even literal raw power. Depending on who you ask, they might be a group of elite Foundation agents and researchers who rose to the very top of the pyramid, a secret room full of dusty, old, power-hungry bureaucrats, or a cabal of superpowered beings that transcend the bounds of our dimension. In short, almost nobody is more powerful than the Foundation's O5 Council. But who oversees the Overseers, if anyone at all? If they do exist, then who's the one figure in Foundation lore more secret than the most secretive group imaginable? There's only one answer to this question. A figure known only as... The Administrator. If you spend some time researching the affairs of the SCP Foundation, there's no doubt you would have heard the name. Perhaps in a heavily redacted file, or whispered in fear by a site director worrying about incurring the mysterious figure's wrath. Today we intend to do the impossible, and we just might end up terminated by the red right hand because of it. But we're going to gather all the information available to us, and try to figure out who or what the clandestine administrator actually is. We'll answer your most obvious question first. What's with those weird sandwich-stealing arms? One of the few almost universally accepted facts about the Administrator is their possession of SCP-262, also known as the Coat of Many Arms. Little to nothing is known about the coat's history before it came into the Administrator's possession, and given the huge amount of power the Administrator wields within the Foundation, nobody has the authority to press them for further information. The coat's interior is a spatial anomaly, from which a huge number of anomalous limbs can emerge and perform tasks on the wearer's behalf. It's such a useful item that the Foundation has even considered weaponizing it for field agents, as the arms emerging from the coat are able to perform tasks as diverse as playing the piano with two or more hands, to blocking attacks directed towards the wearer that otherwise would have been fatal. The limbs themselves are also varied, from normal-looking human limbs to tentacles and paws. The Administrator only finally surrendered the coat to the Foundation in the end because it was taking up too much space in their closet, and presumably needed the room for the next season's most fashionable anomalous clothing. For centuries, though, you wouldn't see the Administrator without the many-armed coat. That's right, centuries. Another almost universally accepted fact about the Administrator is that they have a truly freakish longevity. 
potentially living for hundreds of years. There has likely been more than one administrator during the Foundation's extremely long history, but each one has survived longer than any average human. It's also a widely believed theory that the administrator may have been a key player in the Foundation's initial creation, too. There's been a number of potential names speculated for the administrator, including Frederick Williams, Agnes Peterson, Kismet, and the sinister alias, the Spider. Some believe the administrator to be fundamentally human despite certain anomalous qualities, while others speculate that they're the furthest thing from human. This interpretation maintains that the administrator is an entity from a different dimension known as the plane where eyes can't follow, and has a freakish body made from a twisted charcoal-like material tangled with wire mesh and a chaos of different limbs, all hidden under SCP-262. But hey, the administrator species isn't nearly as interesting as their potential role within the Foundation. An issue surrounded with nearly as much confusion and controversy as, well, everything else about them. And just like everything else with the SCP Foundation, the line they feed the public is often different to the words circulating within the Foundation's higher clearance levels. If you want to believe the official stories, then the Administrator is the liaison between the Foundation and the numerous world governments that need to cooperate with them to ensure the successful capture of anomalies. The Administrator is only allowed to edit SCP files, not actually write them, due to apparent conflicts of interest. In many ways, the Administrator is presented as your typical sleazy Washington insider, schmoozing with politicians and government figures to make sure they remain sympathetic to the Foundation's cause. According to observations from people outside the Foundation who've worked with the mysterious figure, they have a pension for finely tailored suits, expensive aged liqueurs, and the amorous company of women. Despite being a bit of a drunken horndog though, people tend to describe the administrator as likable and easy to get along with regardless of where you fall on the political spectrum. They're also respected by many, and whenever something upsets them, even powerful world leaders are eager to try and appease them. Maybe because they are described as being freakishly strong when the situation demands it. Hey, even world leaders can change their minds when they have their arms twisted, literally. While there's nothing too outwardly bizarre about this iteration of the Administrator, we don't actually know how much of this is true. A fact that really shouldn't surprise you by now. And if being well-versed in the world of SCPs has taught you anything, it's that the SCP Foundation's PR and disinformation teams are not to be trusted. So who can be trusted? Is there any perspective on this mysterious figure that can be taken reliably? The short answer is… no, not really. But we do have the next best thing. Recollections from some of the Foundation's most trusted researchers and personnel, and even some of the strange historical figures that have heard about or even run into the Administrator. What follows are some of their answers to the question, who is the Administrator? Professor Kane Pathos Crow said, Oh, he's just something people talk about over lunch or when they're in between assignments. It kills time, and it's a fun game to speculate on who really calls the shots in this crazy world. Field agent Fritz Willy said, I like to tell people he's my brother. Foundation researcher Dr. Snorlison said, I'd like to poke at him and see what happens, just to see if any of the rumors about being made entirely of legs and toes are true, or something like that at least. Director Neil Ghost said, No big deal, son. The ever-stoic Dr. Charles Gears said, There are no records of anyone by that name working for the Foundation. Dr. Iceberg said, Whatever the boss man says goes. I'm not on staff to care about last decade's rumors. Dr. Glass said, I never met the guy. I heard he's pretty interesting, though. I'd love to sit down and have a chat with him, but he's probably too busy. I've never even gotten a call back about it. The wildcard Dr. Alto Clef said, Who? Dr. Chelsea Elliott said, I've actually done some research on him. Earliest records are about 60 years ago, and beyond that there's some vague references to a leader. Most of the records, though, are incomplete or just references by name, not much of substance. Dr. Frederick Hayden said, Please leave me alone. Dr. Jack Bright said, Yeah, I've heard the guy you're talking about. He's just a legendary thing from way back in the day. When we thought there were 1205s, we said he was there to be the tiebreaker. People don't talk about him much now anymore, probably because we don't need icons like that to keep people together. Dr. Jacob Kensington said, I think he bought me lunch once? Dr. Wright said, 
I heard he lives up in a big tower at Overwatch, and he watches down on the O5s from the back of a mighty scaled dragon, and he flies the skies for free. Uh, or something like that. You'll have to wait until I finish the book to hear the whole story. Dr. Kondraki said, Well, we can't tell you exactly what he said, but it was short and to the point, and he was later disciplined for his use of rather rude language. In an interview later suppressed by the SCP Foundation, acclaimed horror writer Stephen King said of his interaction with the administrator, One of the oddest things to happen to me out on the road was an autograph session in Westbrook, I think. A larger gentleman approached the table with a copy of The Stand, said he was a big fan. Now, I think I might have been a little crazy here, but when I looked at his hand holding the book, it was green. I asked if he was okay, and I looked up into his eyes. They were green, too. He said he was fine. It was pretty scary stuff. Dr. Tilda D. Moose said, No. No, I don't even think we humor that one anymore. It's like the mid-tier research staff telling the new people there's a pool on the third floor. Nobody really believes it, but a couple people every year try and ask just to, uh, check. But yes, it's, uh, more or less dead rumor. And Dr. Django Bridge said, Sure, I know him. He hangs out at the pool on the fifth floor. So we return to our original question. Who is the administrator? Do they rule the SCP Foundation or serve it? Are they an anomalous human or a straight-up monster? Are they a liquor-loving political schmoozer greasing the palms of the world's government? Or a mysterious demigod who founded the Foundation and guides it on its quest to contain the anomalous and protect normality? The fact is, we don't know. And thanks to Foundation misinformation campaigns, we may never know. But much like the anti-meme, the administrator is defined as much by what we don't know as what we do. And according to all sources, that's exactly how they like it. But what do you think is the truth about the administrator? Just who exactly is lurking under that coat, if anyone at all? Let us know in the comments, and then go check out Secret Group That Runs the World, SCP-05 Council Explained, and SCP Most Dangerous Secret Labs and Facilities for more of the SCP Foundation's most closely held secrets.